don't know about y'all, but Florida's hot right now. Heat waves all over, and my air conditioning broke today. So if you hear this off to the side today, that's my fan keeping me cool. So if I look a little shiny today, you'll have to excuse me. Welcome to Meet the Tanukis, the show where we get to know the people working at GitLab and making GitLab uh, such a great place and such a fantastic, wonderful company. Um, they pay me to say that. Well, they don't pay me to say that, but they pay me to say things, and it includes things like that. Uh, I'm very excited for today's show. It's actually going to be a little bit like shorter than you might be used to, for those of you who watch all the time, for our dozens of fans out there. We are going to be talking to someone very awesome today. I'm very excited. Uh, one of the first people that kind of came to me for wanting to be on the show and that I didn't have to go out like begging for. Like I did a show and this person showed up and was like, hey, I think this could be really cool. And I was like, I agree. This will be really cool. So I don't need to do a lot of banter. I don't need to do a lot of introducing myself. You know me. I'm PJ Metz at Metz and Around on Twitter, at Metz and Around on Twitch, at Metz and Around everywhere. And I'm so excited to talk to uh, my guest today. And honestly, I kind of just want to like get right into it. Like, well, I'm, I'm hot, I'm sweaty, I'm shiny. You're going to see it. You're going to love it. But today we have on the show, very special guest, Hannah Suter. Oh, wait, I have a sound for this. All right, love it. Hey, PJ. <laughs> Hi, Hannah. It's very exciting whenever there's a reggae horn involved. It just <laughs> right. it means it's a better time, right? <laughs> Hannah, uh, first off, thank you for coming out. And thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you for seeking it out and, and coming to me and being like, I've got stuff to talk about. And I was like, well, I've got a platform. So uh, let's start out real simple. Introduce people. Who are you? What do you do at GitLab? Sure. So I'm Hannah Suter. I'm a senior product manager here at GitLab for authentication and authorization. So I handle everything um, identity related, how you authenticate with GitLab, roles and permissions, keys and tokens, um, SAML, LDAP, all those fun acronyms. So that's me. And all, all identity and authorization and all that, there's tons of acronyms in there. Um, are you the person I talked to about being unable to figure my SSH key the other day? Is that you? I don't think that was me because uh, okay. I don't remember that, but we do deal a lot with SSH, SSH keys. So you could have asked me probably. I did have, uh, I realized something about my uh, my local work. I was trying to work locally and push to repos for work and it never let me do it. It was like, you don't have access. And my brain was like, why, why, why? And then I figured out that I was trying to use the same SSH token for work and personal and personal was A-OK -okay with it, but work was not. And so uh -huh. I had to start from scratch. I was like, I had no idea what was wrong the whole time. And I, I, <laughs> I dove into the docs with a friend and actually and figured it out. And now I can now I can push locally. I don't just have to use a Git pod or web IDE. Awesome. Um, yeah, like it's it's good. So uh, Hannah, like getting into being a senior product manager for authorization and talking about identity and how we know the person you're claiming to be in GitLab is the person and all the uh, the uh, authorization to access things. How does one even get into that as a career? What what took you from maybe school all the way to, to this position? How'd you get here? Well, that's a big question. Um, so I graduated um, from school with a, with a technical degree. So my degree is in information science. Um, in high school, I was um, on the high school newspaper. I was copy editor, and then I also uh, put up our uh, first ever school newspaper website. And this was kind of like back in the day when it wasn't quite so trivial to put up a website. Um, and I won a state award for putting up the website. And looking back on it, it kind of seems like maybe that was foreshadowing. But at the time, I just kind of thought of that was a thing I did. And I had no interest really in tech. Um, so I was thinking about going to school for either journalism or pharmacy. So two very um different things journalism because i like writing pharmacy because hey i heard there's money there i need to make money so it was like very uh <laughs> practical versus what i enjoy um that's so the eternal up, struggle <laughs> that's right i ended up going into school um undecided and whenever you're undecided they make you take a bunch of different electives to kind of try to help you figure out where you want to go um, I ended up needing to take um, one that was on in tech. So I took um, 
Information Science 101. I had an awesome female professor who still to this day when I have the chance to give her a shout out on International Women's Day or whatever I do because she probably uh, doesn't even know it, but she changed the course of my life in terms of um, kind of talk to us about how tech is a lot of people um, and it's not just technology, it's not just coding, um, but it's interacting with people, understanding the need behind what they say and translating that into something that can be delivered via technology really resonated. And then she also gave the, the, uh, the facts about sort of their job um, placement rate after graduation and the average starting salary. And, you know, I kind of thought, hey, maybe this is a good place to land. Um, so I ended up graduating with an information science degree. Um, and then I came out of school and worked in uh, IT consulting, doing QA work. Mm. Um, I kind of reached lead QA about two years after I graduated and thought, like, is this it? Like, surely there's, <laughs> surely there's more. Like, I, uh, I'm always looking for the next challenge. And sometimes that's a double edged sword. Um, mm. But I was kind of looking for the next thing to do. And I thought, hey, um, I'm going to ask. I was I was at a I moved from consulting into a um, full time job like, um, you know, uh, I guess a regular salaried employee. And after I did about a year of leading QA there, I asked if I could code. Um, mm. And they said, sure. And um, <laughs> I was kind of, I didn't get any ramp up time, but I was just kind of expected to learn on the job. And um, I spent about two years doing software engineering, writing code. Um, and then at that same company, I kept um, asking why, like, why are we building this feature? Like, can I come into the customer meeting and understand what the customer is actually saying? Because I felt like at that time, product wasn't as much of a big field, like some little companies, mm. like the one I was at, they didn't have product managers. Um, and so kind of over time, I started asking why too much and got into <laughs> a more customer facing role, um, ended up in product and sort of feel like that's been a great fit for me ever since. Um, I will say how I got into identity specifically is, um, a few leaps into my product career. I ended up working on a cloud platform, um, team. And so mm -hmm. I was the product manager for API products. They don't have a front end. Um, and actually I kind of really like that because front end to me, I'm like, seems trivial. You know, I know it, I know it's important, but I am like, there's a lot of reasons it has to exist, absolutely. But I think I think I understand what you mean. The idea of like developers being like, yeah, like yeah, front end. It also it gets confusing really fast. I had to do some CSS the other day, and it took me hours. I was like, I was beside myself. But oh my the the fun stuff does seem to be APIs and back end and sort of like get, getting your hands real deep into like like the the logic of it all, right? Right. It's just like the scale of it. Like you can do something with an API and write a script that does something that would take like 10 hours for a human to click through the UI and do. So I like that aspect of it. I like the fact that it was very logical in terms of like, here's an endpoint, here's the things you can give to the endpoint, here's what the endpoint can return. Yeah. Um, and so there wasn't, I didn't have to account for like browsers or, you know, how does it look on my Apple watch or anything? Like that. <laughs> it's <laughs> um, nice to not have those concerns. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so I ended up, um, on a cloud platform team, which I liked, um, ended up switching jobs again and going to cloud platform, but this cloud platform role also included their identity product. Um, and so I took that on and really started to dive into the world of identity and then ended up um, at GitLab after they reached out to me um, with, because of my identity experience. Okay. They were looking for a identity PM and I've always wanted to work at GitLab. I think I applied three times in, in the past and got rejected every time on the initial uh, resume submit. Mm -hmm. um, but this time the difference was that they were looking for someone, uh, they reached out to me and they were looking for that identity skill set so it worked out this time finally that's super exciting and for, first off to be like like welcome which by the way i'm pretty sure you worked here longer than me but like to finally get to the place that you've wanted to go is such a fantastic feeling i love how your journey went so many different directions and it all started because you built a website when you were in high school and i remember back in the day 
there was no like uh i forget what like the popular website building apps and like uh uh companies are but it wasn't like drop and click or you know right. drag and drop stuff but, like you had to write it every time yeah. um so first off congrats on your high school award uh, <laughs> oh thanks <laughs> which it sounds dismissive but yeah. like that's that's hard work and that's really cool and i think it's it's exciting because it did give you this path that you might not have otherwise considered you said at the time you're like yeah whatever but without that little experience the teacher of information systems that meant so much to you might not have resonated with you because you wouldn't have had that backlog that background yeah yeah that's really true it's kind of it's always fun you know as you get older to look back and kind of see how the pieces that you didn't realize had any significance actually did and were working in your favor so I, I think the older I get, the more uh, Robert Frost's poem, Two Roads Diverged in a Wood, makes sense. Yes. It's, uh, it's something I, I've constantly quoted it with my, my podcast that my friend and I have. I'm constantly talking about it to people. I used to teach it. It was my favorite. All right. So you get to GitLab after being recruited, which is also a nice feeling. They said, hey, we like what you're doing. Please tell us more about what you're doing. And now you're here and you're working on identity, but earlier identity wasn't really a part of your job title. Uh, so what does identity mean at, at GitLab? What is it that you do here now? Yeah, so identity at GitLab is sort of, it's a lot of security, um, honestly, because it's very important um, to make sure that our identity ecosystem here at GitLab is, um, is of the of the utmost importance right we can't afford any security breaches we can't afford our customers having any security breaches so how i see what we do is we provide a toolkit for the people who administer gitlab so let's say you're setting up gitlab at your company um, you're adding users we provide a toolkit where you can make your gitlab instance as secure or as flexible as possible. And we obviously most of our customers want some combination of those two things. Right. Um, but it's really, it's really challenging and really interesting depending on your industry and some of the compliance regulations um, from that toolkit that we give our administrators, you know, what are the, what are the security tools? What are the developer efficiency tools um, and how we can kind of marry those two things together to make a system that's both secure and accessible. Yeah. And that's the balance that you have to strike between making sure that developers are able to get in and do the work that they need to do, but also that it keeps out people who shouldn't be in there. Um, I imagine that's very difficult. And, and like you said, every industry, every company has different needs with that. Uh, the Army, you know, the like the U.S. Army Cyber School and the Air Force have very different needs from a startup of 10 people, you know? Right. Yeah, one of the interesting things um, we're taking a look at, too, is how do we take the data that we have in terms of what our GitLab users are doing and how can we flag for suspicious behavior? So let's say we have all of our controls in place. Um, someone still does get through and a credential becomes compromised. We first need to make sure that the blast radius of that leaked credential is as small as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but also, can we immediately turn off their access? Can we block them? Can we ban them? Can we suspend them from cloning the same repo 20 times in 10 seconds? Because that's weird, you know? So we're, <laughs> looking at, we're looking at some of those sort of suspicious behaviors and how we can flag those immediately and, and reverse, stop the damage before it's done, basically. That's wild. Uh, this is suspicious. This user seems to really like this repo or... <laughs> Right. They can't seem to figure out how to make it work locally, so they just keep retrying. I know personally, <laughs> there's lots of times I've like cloned and recloned and recloned because I was doing something wrong. In right, and that's again a balance because we don't want to be flagging legitimate users and then stopping what they're doing. Absolutely. Um, so yep. That's wild, and so like it's that finding that balance between making sure who has access, who needs it, and and who's out, who doesn't. Uh, do you work with with customers directly you said recently that you were like looking into how users are using it together like data to see what's best do you have like user requests that you ever see or people who want something different or more um what does that look like yeah i'd say our most requested feature right now is that we have five static roles in gitlab um so whenever you're set up as a user 
you automatically get, or by your administrator, get assigned one of those uh, static roles. And each one of those roles has a list of permissions of what they can and can't do within GitLab. Right. Um, we've seen uh, a lot of requests for, hey, I want to make my own custom roles, right? Don't limit me to these five. I want to create a new role and I can have it be as privileged or as, you know, least privileged mm -hmm. as possible. Um, but we, our customers are really wanting uh, more fine grain and granular uh, roles and permissions. That's gotta be, I mean, that sounds like if I were a user and it was like, hey, I want to bring this person in. I want them to be able to view the code, but I don't want them to be able to contribute to it. I want them to be able to pull, but not push. Having like a checklist, you can be like custom role and sort of check that does sound great. But on the GitLab side of things, that sounds really hard to create and implement. Yeah, that's where that's where we're at with it right now. Um, we've done a lot of validation and we have everything drafted up in terms of how it's going to look and feel. Mm -hmm. But we have our technical constraints. And I think anyone in software uh, understands that these sometimes run deep and they're not easy to untangle. Um, so right now we're going through the exercise of figuring out how exactly we can change our permissions model to accommodate the custom roles and permissions. Yeah. So when we're talking about um, identity, I feel like within identity, often it's not uh, spoken about in in the business. Uh, the way we talk about it at GitLab, where it's like proving you are who you say you are. Um, have you ever uh, worked with or or been a part of any studies or gone to a conference where they've talked about identity outside of like tech and outside of software, where it's more like like the way driver's licenses work or like biometric stuff? Uh, like, have you ever done any work with that? Yeah, so I think I went to a conference in Silicon Valley um, in April, and it was really eye opening because after working in identity um, since uh, well, everyone's benchmark since COVID. That's whenever I started <laughs> working in identity. So that was March, 2020. Yeah. Um, I felt like, you know, I've been immersed in this for two and a half years now. I, I think I know my stuff, but then, you know, you go to a conference that's focused on identity and you learn how much broader identity is, um, than just usernames and passwords. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of biometrics. Um, there was a really interesting uh sort of tension at this conference with this company called worldcoin that is um going around with this little silver um sphere that they have that's called the orb and it scans uh people's retinas and they're primarily doing this in third world countries under the promise of if we scan your retina that's your credential to access your world coin which is a kind of cryptocurrency um that isn't worth anything right now but the hope is that hey eventually it will be um, and so that was controversial. There was a journalist there who was asking them a lot of hard questions about the ethics involved in that um, mm -hmm. in terms of scanning people's biometrics uh, when they don't really understand um, exactly what they're consenting to. Right. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, and another thing is blockchain. Like if I had a dime for every time someone said <laughs> blockchain uh, at this conference, <laughs> But people are really excited about digital identity on the blockchain and having no one place be the single source of truth, but instead having your identity be validated on the blockchain yeah. um, it would make identity a lot harder to steal. Um, it's a lot better for privacy in terms of who owns your data. Um, mm -hmm. And right now we give a lot of our identity data to uh, anything we log into or uh, we blindly click the consents uh, and who knows where our personal information is really going. So I think mm -hmm. everyone's really excited about the privacy um, implications for decentralized mm -hmm. identity. Yeah. And that's that's mostly when I when I hear about the, the positives about what blockchain can do outside of crypto, outside of NFTs, which I've never seen anything fall off the face of the earth as quickly as NFTs did. <laughs> kind of interesting to see that happening in real time. I know. <laughs> I, it, it went from like almost everything on my Twitter feed to like, I have to like look for it now. But that's besides the point. Uh, there is an excitement around new technology and the way the new technology gets used, implemented, there's always a sort of like uh, the first way it's tried, the next way it's tried, and then there's the way that sticks. And you have to stick around to see the way it sticks. And identity seems like an interesting thing uh, that can, that it can be used for. And certainly I think a, a net positive if it's used correctly, but um, gosh, you're right about all the ways that we consent to our data. 
uh, being used. I can't tell you how many times out of uh, a, a desire for expediency, I just accept every single cookie. Um, I don't think I've ever adjusted those settings when I go to a website. It's like, do you accept? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Track me wherever I don't care. I yes, know. Chipotle app, you can see where I am at all times. That's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, that idea of like of identity in the real world within tech, that's that's kind of the new where are we going and yeah. what's the governance around this? And to that point, PJ, um, one thing I'll mention too is a lot of the attendees at the conference were from um, states that, okay, so right now, if you think about who's sort of the owner of your identity, right, it is the state because they are the ones that issue your driver's license, mm -hmm. um, which is based on the verifiable credential of your birth certificate and whatever else you have to bring to get a driver's license. So it's these government agencies that are now seeing the shift in identity of like, we're, we're probably not going to own this anymore. Mm -hmm. So like, where is our part in this ecosystem? Um, how do we consume whatever the verifiable credentials of the future become? So I think government, uh, specifically states, um, the DMVs where there was tons of them at this conference, all just trying to learn. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing. It's, 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 it's so unsure where we go next because for such a long time identification has been a physical object mm -hmm. you know for for most of human history to identify who you are you have this physical object that proved it and now as we entrench ourselves ever further into the digital world it can't really be just that anymore so it's it's kind of interesting that you said they were there to learn rather than to say here's how it should be done it was like well, yeah. where are we headed and how do we get how do we, we they were Stay definitely home. observers and I mean, they were engaged in the conversation, but it wasn't them proposing anything. Um, but I think it's really interesting too, because at least I tend to have this belief of like, oh, the government's like behind the times and they'll catch up someday, like expect them to be 10 years behind or whatever. But I thought it was pretty telling that so many um, government agencies were at this conference and we're trying to get involved in what I think is still fairly early stages, although it is maturing. But. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're getting to that sort of like, I'd say like, like 10 year mark, maybe 12 year mark for like blockchain technology. Uh -huh. um, pretty dope, pretty dope. So um, one of the things you and I talked about, um, and one of the things that your background in like wanting to be a journalist and writing and the only reason you made a website was for journalism stuff mm -hmm. is the idea of creativity. We talked about this before the show and what creativity really means. And I'd love to hear your take on creativity within tech. How can this be a creative field? I thought it was all just like code, which is very straightforward, you know? So how are we creative within tech? Yeah, that's a great question. And this is something I feel really passionate about because I feel like I wish someone would have told me earlier just the creative opportunities that do um, that do reside in tech. Um, and I go to um, high school and middle, middle schools and I speak um, in terms of tech careers and trying to inspire the younger generation to join tech. Um, and kind of the one exercise I do is we, I have them take a personality test um, and then we kind of map the outcomes of their personality test with different jobs in tech. And I think I have only about eight or so different sort of general jobs, uh, tech right. jobs on my list, but it kind of helps the kids understand, hey, if this is something that's this aspect of my personality could be useful in tech. And the way I see tech is instead of like, you know, paints or um, writing words or um, whatever your creative medium would be, is that ours is through either writing code or making UX decisions mm -hmm. or uh, in product, really listening to customer needs, knowing the business market, trying to meet those two things together to create something um, from nothing. I think yeah. that's the message is that you really can in tech, like on a daily basis, create something from nothing. I see features every day that my developers design that didn't exist yesterday. And then tomorrow they're going to go be used by thousands of people. So from, from nothing to something, I think is really cool and not something that every job gives you. Yeah, exactly. And the idea of creating something new, which is, when I think about like art movements and when I think about, like you said, painting, music, uh, writing, there seems to be a desire to create something that 
can be universally experienced, but is also something new and hasn't been done before. And that desire for uniqueness. So within code, you get that opportunity all the time. And in tech, it's constantly there. Yeah. And I don't think you have to necessarily be heads down writing code in order to produce that because it's all teamwork. There's so many inputs onto the final project, final product. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely not just writing the person, the person writing code that has that experience of taking something from nothing. I think it's the entire team. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you are going and talking to like young students because I immediately thought about how it took a, a woman teaching information systems <laughs> courses in your life that made you even think it was a possibility. H have you realized that you might be the woman for some for some young girl in, in the classes that you're talking to? Well, that's the hope. You know, I'm, I mainly do it from just the angle of giving back, right? Because I feel like tech has been a really good career for me. And I've switched paths a lot in tech. And no matter which way I've switched, I've always felt pretty supported. And there's always been opportunities. Um, so I feel like I, I owe the universe something in terms of uh, giving back a bit and helping others, hopefully, on their journey to tech, if that's where life takes them. Um, or even just understanding that you, there's a lot of different paths in life and you can, even if you don't start in tech, you like, it's where you don't need a degree. We're happy to take anyone who has an interest and can self teach. Right. That's so just, right. Listen, <laughs> the idea that messages. Yeah, spreading that positivity and letting people know it's possible. The only reason I got into it is because someone told me they thought it was possible. So doing that for younger people, showing them that the career options is not just write code that there's a, a variety of ways to get into tech is super important um i think it's fantastic that you do that i can't i can't say enough good things about how um much of an angel of a person you apparently are oh, i don't know about that i know one one day i did a entire day of a teacher's schedule i spoke to her every class and i think she had like six classes and by the end of the day, I collapsed into bed and I had no voice. And I was like, this is what teachers do every day. Oh my gosh, <laughs> how do you do it? I've never yeah. been more exhausted in my life. So I, it made, it totally gave me uh, more gratitude for teachers and how exhausting of a job that is. <laughs> yeah, days where I had to lecture uh, for the whole period for every class were always the hardest days. Oh. Um, and especially because like, uh, it's often a topic that the students aren't excited about. I was like, all right, I'm going to talk to you about Great Gatsby and modernism for 45 minutes. Let's get excited. And I was excited about it. And maybe there were two kids that were excited. But, you know, I always had a few. I had to, uh, hey, it's time to wake up. The bell <laughs> right. <laughs> um, hey, that happened during my presentation, too. I'm not going to deny it. <laughs> listen, someone is not interested in what you have to say, and that's fine. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, this has been super cool. Um, I feel like the kind of, I'd like to ask maybe a final word from you or a final piece of advice. Since you are going around to all these students and talking about tech and trying to make sure people know what options are available, what is some advice that you would give to someone who's just getting started in tech, looking for a career, or who's even younger, wondering if they might be into it? I think my advice would be that the barrier to entry is low. And as long as you have the drive to teach yourself and learn, there's so many resources out there. Um, there's courses you can take for free. There's stuff that has scholarships. I would advise rather than thinking about it, dip your toe into it, try it. Um, there, if you don't like it, there's probably another path you can take or try something else in tech. There's so many different options, but my advice would be don't just stand on the sidelines wondering if it's for you. You can go on YouTube and start your tutorial tonight if you want. Oh my gosh, that as the great Dr. Frankenfurter <laughs> from Rocky Horror Picture Show said, don't dream it, be it, y'all. Don't stand <laughs> on the sidelines. I love it. I didn't think we'd get a Rocky Horror Picture reference here, but I found a way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> awesome. Hannah, thank you so much for, for volunteering to come on, taking time out of your busy day, uh, checking uh, people's identities and virtually checking the cards at the door uh, to come be <laughs> with us. And... Um, to all of you who are watching and listening, stay tuned, pay attention to this channel, keep meeting the Tanukis with us, and I will see you all next time.